You know, I think it can be really challenging to be involved in tech right now. I think it's super easy for us to get unmoored in our own values and figure out what it means to be a good practitioner inside of IT. How do we be a good human? How do we be a good technologist? How do the forces in what we are doing, how do those things exert themselves upon us? And how do we keep ourselves rooted in what's important to us? So I think having some philosophy is important to that. You know, uh, it's a considered life. We think that idea makes sense, right? A considered life is the one we want to have, especially if we are involved in technology. Hi, I'm Phil Yanov. This is the Tech After Five podcast. Welcome aboard. With me today, I've got friends and co-hosts. I've got Carol Hamilton. Carol has got her own podcast. It's uh, Evolving something. Evolving Diversity. Thanks. Evolving Diversity. Carol Hamilton of the Evolving Diversity uh, podcast. I've got my friend, Scott Pfeiffer of Strategy Business Consulting. Hey, Phil. I'm the only one who doesn't have their own other podcast. <laughs> <laughs> he could. He could. And I'd listen if he did. And then, of course, I got my pal, Chris Lockhart from the Consultants Saying Things podcast. Chris, welcome to the conversation. Hey, Phil. Glad to be here. I am glad for all of us to be here. I'm going to press one more mute button because I just realized I hadn't done that. I heard beeps and stuff around me. Um, so I think, uh, I think it is kind of easy. And I think, quite frankly, in technology, we can get there's all kinds of forces at work. We've certainly seen folks go all different routes with this. And I'm kind of curious as to, you know, and again, we're all kind of, none of us here are at the beginning of our career. So I think in the beginning of our career, the structure and the stresses on us might have been even bigger, right? How do we figure out what's the right thing to do? How do we figure out what that's going to be? Um, and I think that uh, having some grounding philosophy might be useful. I wonder what the things are we might have considered along the way. Um, let me start this up with uh, Scott. Scott, um, what do you think about this idea? Is this, is this a thing that you recall maybe as you began what you were doing about how do I find a place to ground myself? Well, it is one of the most common science fiction tropes out there that science unmoored from humanities leads to some dystopian uh, future. Uh, Terminator. Terminators or you know, whatever. Soil uh, green. Exactly. I mean, this is, this runs throughout our, uh, you know, ever since sort of science and technology emerged to the forefront of our civilization, uh, science fiction kind of came out of that movement. And there was the worry that, you know, uh, scientists unmoored from the humanities are just going to create for the purpose of creating and will unleash all manner of horror and doom upon us. Uh, and I think there's something to that, right? I mean, I think that certainly, I think I'm a big believer in technology. I think technology and science hold within them the solutions to most of our problems. Uh, I think Yuval Noah Harari has pointed out that we have, in fact, solved many of the major problems that have bedeviled mankind since we first emerged from the African plains, Um but there has to be something, something to tell us why we should use this technology or to guide us in our use and development of technology. Yeah. I mean, you know, you think about it, and I know there's stories in here about this, right? But, you know, let's say it would have been the time of our grandparents, probably at this point, parents and grandparents, they invented the bomb. That's a real existential threat, right? When Oppenheimer said, Oppenheimer said, I am become death, the destroyer of the worlds. I mean, he is like wandering out saying, philosophically, I'm a little concerned about what I might have created here. And there were, and of course, we know that, again, the bomb being the thing, right? A lot of people worry about what are we going to do with this? What's the right thing to do with this? This was a very real threat. Now, we have something now. I mean, I feel like the technology we're working on now, it's not necessarily a destroyer, but we can modify almost all of human behavior just by getting them involved in one technology or another. And I think this causes us some concern. Carol, I can see the concern on your face for us as good humans and tech. I, I think that 
we are in constant or need to be constant watchdogs on the unintended consequences. And if there was ever a documentary made to, to that point, it's called, it's the social, uh, the, the social dilemma, which is currently running on Netflix. And it really talks about something as, as benign. And this is by the creator, by the way, of the like button on Facebook who said, who knew that this was going to become an object that would people would start measuring themselves by children would commit suicide over that it would have this kind of social implication. And I, and I think that the idea that we're going to stop the technology train is, is idealistic, but I think if we don't continuously say, let us watch it, what the reactions are and try and get it on those first couple of ripples instead of waiting until it becomes the H bomb of of today i think that that's really really important yeah chris i'm going to say that when i started i can remember a time when i was beginning in my technology career maybe it wasn't even career yet i was might have been even younger just thinking about it i really saw myself as a determinist i thought the universe was a clockwork and that it was just kind of counting its way forward and we had complete and utter control over everything in the world and then i think things kind of shattered that for me i don't know if uh Somewhere in all of this role of science and science fiction, you had some ideas of your own about how the world worked, that uh, the world itself had different ideas. Well, yeah, I mean, I think what you're talking about, it's, it's Plato's, uh, what was it, T Timaeus, I think it was called, right? He um, talked about sort of the, the universe as the, the work of, uh, I think he called it like a divine craftsman kind of thing. Right. Right. And um, I think it's that's fascinating because he talked about blueprints and like all of these different things. And you know, I think that's like the, the great clockmaker kind of um, approach to to this i think you know if you go back even further than that though right you get um this idea that you know humans do things with technology as a result of trying to imitate things they see in nature right weaving as a as an outgrowth of uh watching spiders create webs right that kind of thing um and i think it was Aristotle that actually went further and said, it's more than that. It's more than just imitating. We're actually taking it to places that nature couldn't take it, right? And in other words, we're not just imitating nature. We're, we're doing, we're going beyond, we're going beyond nature um, and, and shaping nature and things of, of that nature, right? It's like, and so as you go forward in this historical context and you get into folks like, um, uh, what was his name? He wrote De, De Architura, Architectura, um, Vitruvius, Vitruvius, right? He um, he talked about this as as again, right? We're, we're and that, I think that was Roman Roman era, but like this is talking about how we build upon things that we see around us in order to make our lives better. Um, and then I think in the modern era, it was uh, I think Francis Bacon, right? He wrote in one of his books, I forget which one it was, right? But it was about you know that that this was an optimistic sort of thing to extend man's power over nature, right? And and really sort of control our environments. And so when you look at it through that context, it's like, wow, this is amazing. This is this linear progression of mankind progressing to the stars, right? Like the Gene Roddenberry view, right? Of like, you know, everything is going to go in this straight line and everything is wonderful. If you look at actual history, right? History is not this line of progression into the future that goes unbroken. It's like, it's like this, right? And, and then like way down and then some back up and there's not this, it's a myth that like, you know, um, with every new invention is progress. The printing press was progress because it enabled people to read. Yes, but it also enabled mass propaganda, right? Like, is that, you know, a, a positive outgrowth of the, the printing press? So I think that what it comes down to for me is context, right? It's the context with which you're looking through the lens of, um, you know, is is there is there a philosophy uh, around technology or for technology? I think it's going to depend on you know, what you're expecting that tech to do, right? What you're expecting out of it. If it's I'm watching a spider web and I'm going to invent weaving and then power it with steam or water um, because I want to make clothes, that's one thing, right? If it's I'm I'm going to invent the printing press because I want to indoctrinate the masses in my um, my particular ideology, maybe maybe that's not so good, right? You know, uh, Scott, I'm sure you could have thought about this, too, because kind of like as Chris was talking about, the whole thing of creating this forward, this a singular momentum, right? Um, 
Asimov's Foundation Trilogy, really? I mean, you know, you kind of saw, I mean, that he, he thought it would be possible to predict the future thousands of years from now just by like look, reading the tea leaves today, right? I mean, that's really what he was doing. Sure. Yeah, he had great computers. <laughs> yeah, great computer. With the best computer, I can know what's going to happen tomorrow. But even he could only shorten the dark time, right? He knew it was coming. He knew the collapse of civilization was coming. He could only hope to shorten the, the uh, collapse by a little bit. Yeah. So then it becomes um, there. There are com there are lots of forces on it, right? And there's even the force of us. You know, we could give up, right? I mean, at some point, you could say, "Wow, this is a little bit overwhelming." And uh, you know, I think about, uh, I know a lot of us were fans of the uh, first series on True Detective, but Rustin Cole was what he called a realist, but was really a kind of nihilism, right? I mean, his whole, Rust Cole was like, I think it was a bad move for humanity to decide that it was going to, you know, get out of the pond and kind of do whatever comes next, because uh, I really don't, I think this is whole, I think consciousness was a bad move. That was his whole thing. Now, I understand that there's a whole movement that thinks that there's something positive that comes out of that bit of saying, well, I'm just going to give up. Um, but that's not really kind of going to work for me, I don't yeah. think. You know, there's a great story talking about the use or control of technology and, and should you, just because you can, should you. There's a great story about a Roman emperor uh, who is rebuilding Rome and these, these inventors come. And they have invented these terrific machines that will use screws and levers and pulleys to help him build. And they say, you know, this machine uh, emperor can take the place of a thousand workers. One guy with this machine could do the work of a thousand workers. It'll save you so much money and your your monuments and, and palaces will get built so much faster. And he says, are you kidding me? If you put all those workers out of work, I'll have riots. <laughs> They'll burn the city to the ground. Get out. And he, throw, he throws them out of Rome and exiles them so that they won't bring their machines in and cause a massive social disruption. Yeah. The, I mean, and that's a real consequence, right? I mean, things. some technologies come in and they kind of change the way the world looks in a way that would takes a long time for society to kind of figure out. And this is kind of where Carol was, I think, particularly inside this social dilemma. And I know that... Um, some of us have kids and you got to figure out what comes next for your kid. I mean, I have a real concern for my teenage kids and what their interactions with social media are. Cause this is basically, and I've said this, you know, in some of my previous interviews, it's a digital drug and some folks are clearly going to become addicted to this. And we have to figure out how to help them navigate that. You know, I want to help my kids in the early stages, figure out how to navigate that. But I think that's a, that becomes a thing. So here I am as a person who says, look, I need to talk to people. I need to meet people. Um, maybe I could or should be using Facebook ads to do this. Is that the right thing to do when I go on to go out? And, I mean, and if I'm working for some other company that's working big data, you know, I've got uh, nieces working for biotech and so forth. And, you know, their ability to use the data that they are collecting and stuff in biotech, it might not always be used towards good ends. How do we come up with the way to figure out what's the right thing to do? Carol, how am I going to figure this out? You know, I, I, I had a story of my grandfather many years ago was, a, was an engineer who discovered that he had been put on a project that was, that was a military, um, he'd worked on military projects for years, but this particular one was a, was a bomb. And he said, you know, that's the end of my career. I'm not doing this. I don't want to be a part of that. But we, and I'm, I was too young to have any real in-depth conversation about it, but I have talked with my mom a bit about how he approached that. And he said, you know, the thing is, really smart people really want to hurt others. And we're not the problem. It's not the, it's not the idea that's the problem. It's not the original engineer. It's what happens when that technology gets in the hands of other people with malintent. And I think that's always the case, whether it's far, you know, biological warfare or anything else, because the same thing that can save the, the planet can also destroy it, used in, in another context. And I love the idea of just having that conversation around context and continuously reminding ourselves of the context of what it is you're doing, not to stop it per se, but just to be cognizant of where it can go. And I think it comes up in us as individuals, as humans, when you get to that point where you go, something feels off. 
And, and I think that we have to stop in that moment and say, I'm going to realign, I'm going to regroup, I'm going to investigate before I keep going, because something feels off. And I think we have that within us, but we have to take the time to hear it. Yeah. I, and I, I don't recall that this was a theme of the social dilemma, which I did watch, but I know that it has become a question in tech. The thing is, a lot of folks created technology saying, well, look at the good it can do. Look at the good it can do. I want to I want to be able to do this thing and I want people I want to build community. I want people to be able to come together or whatever it might be. And I can think about what could the good can it do? And it was there was such a naivete because no one asked, well, what harm might it be used for? Right. It just did not occur to some folks early on to ask the question, well, what is the harm? And I think that uh, more than ever, the tools that we can become part of in tech, the part of creating, the part of using, uh, deploying, uh, they can be used for some harm. And we just have to figure out how we might do that. I mean, I want to ask Chris Lockhart this question because he's kind of, he's in the space where it's not just him using a tool. He is helping his clients in a consulting fashion, figure out how to use the tool. And they're big companies. I mean, Chris, how does this manifest itself in your work? Yeah, I'm going to throw out another literary reference real quick, right? So I'm going to paraphrase um, Edith Wharton in Ethan Frome, I think is the book, right? Like technology is a wonderful, terrible thing, right? It's It has like this, you know, the potential for sort of the greatest possibility for mankind, as well as its greatest danger, right? And so, by the way, not to be melodramatic, but the same is true for companies, right? It's like, you know, the constant battle of what tool should I use to solve this problem? And it's like, mm, here's the thing, right? A fool with a tool is still a fool, right? You you have a problem, and if, if you're using a tool to accelerate it, uh, you're just, you just have a problem faster, right? And so it's this idea of, you know, technology for technology's sake is probably not the right answer to man, for mankind's problems, right? It's, you know, do we have a problem? Can we can we bear, bring to bear some of our knowledge on this and, and leverage some of the technology, right? I think it's it's called like technological determinism, if I'm getting the phraseology here right, which is this idea that, you know, there are sort of capabilities in, in tech, and this is like the most esoteric way of describing this, but you can see how it applies to companies, right? Uh, or your personal life philosophy, right? There's There are features and capabilities within technology, right? that sort of determine how it should be used. And it's sort of the, the role of a sort of a advanced progressing society, right? To figure out ways to adapt that tech and benefit from it, right? Um, but I, 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 I'm just constantly struggling with, with companies that believe that buying a tool is the answer to their problems because it's not. All it does is add another layer of complexity um, and the underlying problems, the root cause, right, is is usually still there. Uh, I would also put in that it's usually not a technology problem; it's usually a people problem. But I'll leave right. that for another time. <clears throat> it uh, is. It's always a people problem because it still takes people to run technology. I love that, and yes, I'm glad you're bringing in the book is, that we you. all that we all have on our bookshelves. You know, yeah, it, it's it's not just it's it it. it it gets even more pertinent right now, like in our lives, because not only are people creating the technology, this is something I talked with Oliver Cronk from Tanium about um, in a webinar a couple of weeks ago. Um, and and it, was, it was people are creating the algorithms that go in to you know, AI and machine learning and all of these things that are then making decisions on their own based on that knowledge, right? Alexa. Do I have any packages today? She'll answer right. about 20 She's minutes. She says right, my yeah. experience. Um, but <laughs> you, you get my point, right? You yeah. Know, okay, that's enough. Stop. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, my Alex is answering you too. Yeah. <laughs> Lockhart just activated thousands of, of Alexas yeah. all over. <laughs> yes. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Do not say, hey, Google. <laughs> Alexa, you me Tide Pods. Yeah. Uh, no, so I think it's, you know, it's this idea that, I mean, it's potentially great. Okay. Okay. Stop. Seriously. <laughs> no, Alexa, stop it. It was ordering Tide Pods. Um, 
it, it's this thing that not only can we do great and amazing things, but we're creating right. things that are then going to make decisions on our behalf, right? And that's potentially dangerous if we don't uh, apply, you know, the right. Well, right, because I mean, in if, if we were sitting there and say, well, if we make this decision, we might make this decision, but then if we looked at, it, we said, well, in this case, that might not be the right thing to do. But the algorithm doesn't have the in this case logic or the. I don't know. Or, you know, by the way, if I did this a million times in a row, that would be a problem. Normally, I'm only doing it 10, right? So it's just this super amplified thing. Yeah, I have a friend who calls that the tyranny of the algorithms, right? It is. But it used to be you could take your loan documents into a banker and he'd look at them and maybe they weren't so great, but there was a story behind it and you could get somewhere. Now you plug it into a computer and the computer says yes or no, that's it. And the, the bankers who don't even understand the algorithms are like... So the computer says, man, can't do anything about it. <laughs> and the humanity is out. And that's where we wow. really lose the power of technology, when we give up the humanity. That's because right. I don't, we, we need the technology. It enhances humanity, but it should not take it over. It need, they need to, to work as a pair, that's which is why I like, you know, his device, who I will, will go unnamed She now, who shall not be named. She who shall not be named. <laughs> You know, immediately jumps into anything you say. And we have no idea who's behind she of all the other things that are happening in that, which, of course, have come to light in various times. Yeah, I mean, tech is a tool and tools are tools yep. exist to enhance existing human capabilities, but not to not to completely supplant them. Tools no, still need to be wielded by humans so that they can apply. That's what, you know, some of the most uh, frightening things on the military front are these uh, autonomous drones that they're now talking about maybe being completely untethered from a human pilot and flying around killing just based on algorithms. So I, I'd be generally against that. Yes. <laughs> so what you're, what you're talking about, there's actually something in sort of historical analysis that deals exactly with that. And it's been around forever, right? And it's called, um, let me get this right. It's called the, the Great Stirrup Controversy. So you think about a stirrup, right, being, you know, the stirrup on a horse. The argument is that the introduction of this technology actually led to the deployment of cavalry in medieval Europe, which created feudalism, right? Yes. Because, because of the, the structure of, of the society that came up around this tech. In other words, tech drove a negative thing. Tech drove society rather than sort of the other way around. Yeah. I yeah. wonder if Alexa is doing that to us now. The invention of the longbow flipped it back the other way, right? Once the once the knights showed the commoners that the longbow was powerful at Crecy and Poitiers, the commoners started thinking, hey, what do we need these jackasses on horseback for? Right. <laughs> so will there be a will will there be a great Alexa controversy in a thousand years? You know, I I really like your point earlier, Chris, about how, you know, even though maybe the broad arc of history is one of advancement, and I think I think most people would say we are, in general, better off than we were 5,000 sure. years ago, right? Uh, it's not, when you look closely at it, it's not a straight line. It's ups and downs and ups and downs. I would say that, you know, the invention of the, um, the loom, right, the power loom, that probably over time has been a very good thing, right? Clothes are very easy to make now. They're very inexpensive. I have lots of clothes. Medieval times, you might own one or two pairs of clothes if you're a regular person because they were expensive. And but when that loom was invented, the Luddites smashed them all because this the making of lace went from these highly skilled craftsmen who could command high wages. And now with the invention of this technology, the same work could be done by anyone for low wages. And so they were even though this tech was going to be good over time at that particular time, it was very hurtful to that one group of people. And so I think that argues, I think this goes with what Carol's saying too, that we need some thought around implementing new tech because there are always unintended or even highly foreseeable negative circumstances when you introduce new tech. I think the printing press probably over time has been a very good thing, uh, but to your point, right after it got introduced, it was used to fuel the the um, the Protestant Reformation and the schism, and probably caused the Thirty Years' War. So you're saying the millions press, of deaths. You're saying the printing press was the original rage machine. It was the original Twitter. Is that? <laughs> yes. 
Well, that's exactly right. I mean, I think that's exactly right. It was the original Twitter, and it, you know, it it allowed for increases in literacy and for people all over to access knowledge they never could have accessed before. I mean, it did a lot of great things, but it also allowed, you know, people to write pamphlets and flame everybody up and, uh, you know, get them Is to it, go say murder. I'm just going to say, by the way, that I'm going to, there will definitely be a promo for this episode of the podcast that says, this is the only podcast you're going to listen to all month where someone uses the word Luddite in a non-metaphorical sense. <laughs> he means the actual Luddites. The actual Luddites. <laughs> right? <laughs> I thought you were going to say the printing press was the original rage machine. It's also a good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll do that too. So I'm in the grocery store the other day, and there are six lines of self-scanning. Self, um, and there are four lanes of human scanner, scanners, cashiers, and all of the humans are standing there waiting for customer. And there is a line of customers at the self-serve where you help yourselves. And I thought, now, this is an interesting comment on technology because a year ago or whatever these things started, it might have been two years ago, uh, people were so hesitant to even use them. And now they prefer them to the point of they will wait in line to scan their own groceries as opposed to going over to the human. And I, I don't have the answer to this question, but I was wondering what shifted because that is that understanding is, the, I think, one of the, the axis of where all of this happens. Where is this pivot point where suddenly we go, ah, technology, I'm going to follow that and ignore the fact that we are now watching our neighbors get fired because they're just standing there. Yeah, that's interesting because I will I will not go to the self-scan thing unless the human one is six people deep. Yeah, <laughs> right. me too. I, I never I was, wanted to work at a Walmart. I never <laughs> wanted to work at a Walmart. <laughs> not my, not my job. <laughs> right. Um, you know, it's funny. And the thing is, I just want to put up just a tiny bit of perspective in this. Uh, I used to work for the woman who installed the very first ATM in the state of South Carolina. And it was up on Lawrence Road. And that bank is no longer there. But she installed and she she would tell she had story after story about people who said that would never work. That people would always prefer to go talk to a banker that the ATM was never going to work. And uh, it obviously made a big cultural shift. I don't know what this, I, and I don't mean to, that's by no ways an explanation of Carol's story, because I don't quite understand that myself, because I will eschew the self-checkout line in almost every place, particularly in a grocery store where I might have something that has to be weighed. No, oh, yeah. not going to yeah. happen, man. Just oh, yeah. the cucumber code. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. I mean, I watch what those people do to figure out the cucumber code who've been there, who keep working there. I have not a chance in the world of figuring out the code for cucumbers oh. versus broccoli. They now have actual picture of icons so that had they have eased the process but i was absolutely stunned i couldn't it was the first time i've ever seen it that way and i thought this is where it happens it happens right now when the when the store manager or owner looks out and says ah now we have a preference being marched and it is so much easier to put in another machine than to pay all of the expenses required and all of the tolerances necessary to have a human in that role i think you're right i wouldn't be surprised if before I'm gone. There are no more cashiers like that. Although I think it'll be less you go check yourself out than it'll be just there's trackers on everything and you just roll your right. car and it charges you. Kind of like oh, the, the Amazon store example. Right. Yeah. The new Amazon store. Yeah. I think that eventually this, you know, cashiers, this whole self checkout cashier thing is a modern invention. I think it was either Win Dixie or Piggly Wiggly that invented it. Piggly Wiggly. Before you went to the store and there was a counter and a man and you gave him your list and he went and got all the stuff and brought it to you and rang it up. That's how it worked. And then Piggly Wiggly invented the whole idea of you go pick it yourself and bring it to the front and we'll and we'll ring you up. And the supermarket right. was born. Right. So yeah. even the even the checkers at the front is a you know a modern invention, right? It is. But that that's a story that itself is fraught with problems of its own. Uh, both social and that particular dude. Mm -hmm. But, um, <clears throat> you know, I, so let me ask, and we're not going to answer the full answer to this question, but let's ask this. So what's our goal here? 
right? I mean, when we're in technology and we're trying to figure out a philosophy, what, how do we know our philosophy is going to do the right thing? I mean, am I doing it at the really big scale? Am I doing it for that? I have to uh, do the greatest good for the greatest number in my pal box kind of thing? Is that the greatest good for the greatest number? Is that the outcome I'm looking for? Is it the good for me? Is it just me to act as a good person? Am I maximizing my utility, my enjoyment? Um, what's the, what is the framework? What are the objectives for whatever framework I'm going to pick for myself? Something that I'm going to use for decisions. What do you think? Wow. Well, I mean, that's the very idea of ethics, right? To determine that's that. right. Is it Bentham's utility? Is it some other measure? Right. right. And the Stoics would say that you had, it's kind of a three part thing, right? You had logic, um, physics and ethics, physics and ethics, and that logic and physics sort of leads to ethics, right? Right. And, Physics would be not just actual physics, but all the sciences. Right. Right. But just a just the idea that we're gonna base what we what we think and what we do and how we act on real science, not you know, BS. And then logic is the capability of reasoning. We're gonna apply our reasoning, like Carol says, we have to apply our reasoning and our thinking to this science. And then if we can do those, if we can take our knowledge of the world through science and apply our logic rigorously to it and not apply logical fallacies and, you know, slippery slope arguments and those kind of nonsense, then we can come up with some sort of ethical framework that will inform our lives and the way we're going to use technology or present technology. Yeah. Um, I'll go with, I think, you know, the, the lens that I would always use is outcome. What is the outcome of what I'm trying to do and how will, how will that be guided by philosophy, right? To use the self-checkout example, right? Why were they created? Not to make your life easier. It wasn't to make it easier for shoppers. Right. It was to lower labor costs and That's save right. space. That's the purpose behind self-checkout. It's nothing to do with you as the customer. It's everything to do with the, the intent, uh, the context of the, uh, the shopping, the, the supermarket trying to uh, improve their, their bottom line. And, and, and what is the outcome of that, right? So here, here's the outcome driven thing, right? I think it was NCR did a study. Um, shoplifting is five times higher through the self-checkout line. Five times. Wow. Intentional, not intentional, but five times higher, right? Um, and so the question is, right? Is that an acceptable outcome for the benefit of saving the amount of money on uh, cashiers and right. increasing the floor space for more product and um, perhaps uh, better logistics through some sort of you know system? Um, and so for me, that's that's always it's it's <laughs> I hate to be so simplistic, but it's the pro con. It's this cost benefit analysis sort of perspective that says you know is what I'm doing worth the outcome that I, I expect to get from it? And if not, why am I doing it, right? As sort of a philosophy. And I think, you know, at that most base level, right? That's what it is. You, you bring that up a few levels and puts better words around it. And it's like, you know, for, for clients, for companies, you know, is the outcome, is the expected anticipated value that you're gonna get out of this thing, whatever you're doing, the tech worth the effort, the cost and the likely problems and uh, side effects uh, of of the thing um and so i think you know that that would be the framework that i would use to sort of answer that question yeah, yeah i like that and then i think we have kind of the roman emperor problem right where you had the tech is designed to save labor it's designed to save money but how are we going to make sure that we don't um cause harm to the workers that are no longer going to be working right do we do we act like the Roman emperor and just smash all the self-checkout machines or the Luddites? You know, we can't have those because they'll lay off grocery workers. Or do we have to figure out a way as a society to take the, the savings and equitably uh, let everyone's boats rise? Scott, we just have to bridge that into some other in utility, with a, right? With a little thin technocrat class at the top of society that has everything and lives on a a satellite, you know, and the, the teeming masses of roiling dystopia. Until I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. They figure out in that, like in that movie, how to create the little jumpsuit where they pop up to the thing and they kill everybody, you know. <laughs> so, so you, Scott Piper, are the modern day Ned Ludd. Is that <laughs> right? Right. Well, I'm saying that that's, that was their solution. The Luddites and the Roman Emperor, that was their solution was 
we're not going to deploy the technology. What I'm saying is we need a better solution because right. deploying the technology, I think, can be good for everyone, but we need to figure out a way to make it good for everyone. Yeah. And it, <laughs> right. And I, I get all of the ironies wrapped around all of this, right? It's like, oh, we're going to eliminate cashiers and they're all going to go work to marketing. And then we're going to put them in marketing and then we're going to have like Facebook, but it's all going to be algorithm driven. So we don't need them in marketing anymore. And they're going to be physicians. And then, you yes. know, but, but now we're going to have auto docs. And da, 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 but it, yeah. then we'll teach them to code. Oh, wait a minute. We won't need that either. Cause in two years, that's good. Wait, yeah, wait a Ross. second. <laughs> we'll always need people to code. Andrew Wang says this problem is we're going to give everybody a universal basic income. Yes. Savings, right? So, you know, but that's, is that the answer? I don't know that that's the answer. Uh, but I think that smart people informed by humanities in a sense of history need to be figuring out that answer. Right. So there's a group for anybody that's interested in uh, right now it's COVID has done run amok with this, but there's a group out of Virgin um, United, which is called 100% human at work. And it's CEOs and just anybody who cares coming together saying, how do we, how do we cross these bridges? Because universal income throwing money at people does not throw purpose at them. And it doesn't mean that you've got a happier population. It's possibly that you have a less a, a rioting population because now they have time and et cetera. And so it's absolutely taking into accountability that there is a cost and you always have to follow the money because that will lead you to a lot of things. But then what is the human cost, that soft dollar cost that isn't hard dollars? And is that being a part of the consideration? Because in some cases you can apply it ahead of time. I think one of us, one of you mentioned that where you said it's it's not that you say the technology has to stop, but it's, hey, what if we were to already look ahead and say this could happen and put the best and brightest minds into the unintended consequences so that you can at least see what you can see, address what you can see? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important for people to have purpose, right? I mean, if you look at um, incidences of rioting and terrorism and things like that across the world, the places where uh where things have really broken down and you superimpose that with a map of unemployment among young males uh, between 15 and 30, those two maps look really, really the same. Um, but that doesn't mean we couldn't maybe progress to a, a place where the employment people are in doesn't have to be all uh, within a capitalist enterprise where they're making money. Right. I mean, it used to be we had a world where 80 percent of us were involved in growing the food that we all needed to eat. Right. Right. And today, like one percent of us do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So right. The, the, the workforce and what people have to do changes over time. Um, and it's going to change on its own with fits and starts and rebellions and riots. Or we can try and guide it a little bit and, and maybe, you know, like the like the uh, foundation yeah. to work with our times. So well, let me ask the capstone question on this piece here. Oh, um, so first off, we start with the idea, is does tech driven by a particular philosophy or is there one that's in particularly uh, useful or that is everyone needs to have inside of tech? Do you think that's, is that something that everyone's got the same or is there something that we all ought to be believing the same philosophy? Yes or no? I'm not a one size fits all in anything. I just don't think it, there is a single solution to any given problem. Right. I, it seems hard to say yes to, but I thought maybe someone might say, no, there's, there's something underlying this that we I need to recognize. There was one, the idea that we could implement it and get everybody to do it the same way is impossible. Yeah. Yeah. I think otherwise you're like, you know, what's his name? Harry Seldon, right. And foundation, right. You're you know, I, I don't I don't know how you can sort of answer all of the questions with one, you know, unyielding framework kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Um, right. Even Harry Seldon accidentally created the mule. Right. Right. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. But I do think the question can remain the same, which is let's do, you keep asking, keep asking, stay in this conversation. Yeah. Our lives are experiments. Right. I mean, we're all running an experiment trying to figure out a way through this thing one way or another. 
Well, I, this is the question I wanted to ask to begin with. Are we being driven to some place? Is it, you know, is one work better than the other? And I think that's not necessarily it. But I think we all have to say, we've got to figure out what the answer is for ourselves. And what does it mean to be good? What does it mean to act with uh, in a virtuous manner, right? And I haven't specifically brought in the framework of stoicism on this yet. I think that's a thing where I want to go to in another episode, right? But the idea is, you know, what does it mean to be virtuous in this moment? And how do we do that? And I think acting with virtue, that is good for ourselves, good for the people around us, acting in, in a way that is congruent with the everyone thriving and flourishing in their space, that's a hard thing to come by. And it's easy to get it wrong but if we simply, the problem is, if we think we have the answer, we're probably in trouble, right? Those are the cats yeah. that are the most in trouble. The one is like, oh, I got this worked out, man. It's uh, it's this blank. Yeah, that's terrifying. That puts us in trouble. Yeah. And uh, I, I want us to, I want us all to ask the questions and to kind of go forward with this. So this is all kind of a, a setup for us to be thinking. I'm hoping that the folks who are listening to this, they're thinking the same thing. It's like, you know, I want to know, what are you reading? What are you learning about? What are you doing to figure out how to ans answer the questions for yourself? What does it mean to act with virtue in this space in which we exist, particularly in the world of tech? Because I think we are an outsized lever on the behavior of the world. And uh, there's a real opportunity for us to do really big things. And so that means it's even we're even more responsible for making sure that we are doing the right thing, right? And making sure that we have good outcomes for ourselves and for others as we uh, go forward in this tech career. Uh, this is a tease because we're going to follow this up with some other stuff. And uh, uh, Chris Lockhart and I and whoever else he's got on his team are going to go into the Consultant Saying Things podcast. We're going to talk about this from a consultant's perspective at some point, right? How do we execute this on the lives of others and on our clients? Yeah, and I think it's going to be interesting, right? Because we, we talked a little bit about it today, right? Which is, you know, great if I have a framework. Um, is, is there one framework? Are there multiple frameworks, right? And especially as you get into consulting and you get into uh, things like, enterprise architecture and all these other sort of models for how to address business problems, right? Um, there are, there's no end to the number of universal frameworks, right? That will solve all the problems. It's a bit of sort of psycho history, right? When it comes to consulting, <laughs> right? We can, we can address everything. And so I think it's really, you know, this, this whole thing about if you are a practitioner in consulting, you know, um, how, how do you tackle this? How do you navigate this? Is, is there, is there, for example, like a stoicism for consulting, right? That right. Um, could could be uh, something to organize around uh, in your delivery of services. So should be interesting. Um, hopefully we'll record that soon. Yeah, looking forward to it. All right, um, Chris Lockhart's on consultant saying things. Thank you for being here today with us. Uh, Scott Pfeiffer, strategy business consulting. And where else do we find you? What should you tell us? Find me on LinkedIn at uh, where I'm just Scott Pfeiffer. And you can always send me an email to strategybusinessconsulting at gmail.com. Right. Carol Hamilton, Evolving Diversity. And yes. is that not where we find you? You can also find me at hamiltonthinktank.com or on LinkedIn at Carol Hamilton Live. Super. Thanks. The way you can interact best with us is, of course, um, by the way, if you like the kind of stuff that we talk about, you should tell your friends about it. And leaving reviews is like telling even more people about it. That is a desired outcome. We are preferred indifferent outcome to that thing, right? We want you to tell your friends about us so that your friends might like us too. Uh, but the best way to interact with us is to come to one of our award-winning Tech After Five events. You can uh, sign up at techafterfive.com and we can engage you in not only conversations with us, but with the people that we know across multiple events. We've just recently celebrated 600 of those. So uh, 12 years and 600 events. If you've not been to one, why not come to the next one? And, and find out more about Fest what we do. Is coming. And Gadget Fest is coming if you happen to be so listening excited. to this on a timely basis. Mm -hmm. So uh, come and join us at techafter5.com. I'm Phil Yanoff. Thank you for hanging out with us. Mm -hmm.